Hello everyone, I'm Scruffy and this is Scruffy Tales and you've stumbled upon the War Zone. And this is part 3 of my Invasion 2032 series, where we explore how and why Russia would invade Sweden and what is required for that to even take place and how Sweden can uh, defend itself. And in this video, we will see if Sweden is ready to reclaim the mainland and Erland. And on Gotland, resistance is growing against Russian occupation. As I'm writing this, Turkey has now agreed to allow Sweden into NATO, and Hungary has invited Sweden to discuss Sweden joining the Defense Alliance. Will Sweden be allowed into NATO in 2024, or will it never happen at all? With a little bit of luck, Sweden will be allowed into NATO shortly after I'm finished with this video. And also, I really would like for people to check the description for two links to the Grim Reapers channel because they have two simulated battles at sea and in the skies over the Baltic Sea between Sweden and Russia. Russia is in both simulations attacking Sweden and these battles are super realistic. They are intense as hell and if you want to get a feel to what a modern battle at sea would look like, especially when Russia is trying to move in on the Swedish mainland and trying to move in on Gotland. Check these two videos out because they are amazing and intense as hell. So please take a look at those two battles to get a feel for how uh, Russian and Swedish forces would clash at sea. And with that out of the way, we will now move on to the Siege of Nordköping, the Battle for Erland, and Free War. In our scenario, Sweden has not yet been allowed into NATO by the year 2032. In part 2, NATO has blockaded the Gulf of Finland, putting a stop to any Russian reinforcements being brought in from Russia proper. With Russia having a foothold on the Swedish mainland, Sweden redirects all assets to support the Swedish army. This allows Russia to send in more troops to Gotland and eventually conquer the island. Sweden manages to isolate Russian forces at Norrköping, where the Russians prepare for a last stand. Meanwhile, Swedish forces are preparing to launch an assault to liberate Erland from Russian control. With Gotland now under Russian occupation, the last remaining Swedish troops have gone into hiding, planning for a prolonged guerrilla war. Sabotage. Shadows in the night. On day 11 of the conflict, a series of disasters happened simultaneously at the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, all within a span of 20 minutes. At the vital inlet to Kaliningrad that allows ships to enter into the safe basin, two civilian merchant vessels that are flying Russian colors suffer three massive explosions each, taking out their rudders and blowing holes in the hull. 
Both ships start to sink without any hope to steer. They become effective obstacles in the middle of the crucial inlet. Likewise, in the narrow port next to the inlet, a cargo ship filled with Russian troops heading for Gotland suffers the exact same fate as it is about to leave, blocking the narrow waterway almost completely as a result. A tanker carrying oil to the industrial port at Kaliningrad itself is sunk in the exact same way, its cargo causing a massive fire across the water. Ten minutes later, multiple explosions shake Kaliningrad as oil cisterns and gas facilities are detonated, causing gargantuan explosions that blows out windows a mile around. A couple of more ships are targeted at port, increasing the chaos even further. That same night, almost at the exact same time, St. Petersburg is woken up in the middle of the night as well. The industrial port is rocked by explosions as two tankers in port are blown up and several oil cisterns and gas facilities detonate. The combined explosion is, simply put, massive. In fact, the explosion is so violent that two dozen people living in the nearby apartment buildings to the south of the industrial port are wounded by the blast and the resulting debris along with windows shattering. Authorities expect as many as 100 dead between the crews of the ships and the people working at the industrial port. S.O.G. Särskilda operationsgruppen, the Special Operations Group. Sweden's elite unit that is said to be on par with the U.S. Navy's SEAL Team 6. Clouded in mystery and online myths, little is known about this shadowy branch of the Swedish armed forces. But if sabotage is required in foreign ports that are controlled by the enemy, the SOG are more than able to handle the task at hand. Russia suspects and even makes vague accusations that Sweden received substantial assistance from both Finland and Poland in order for the SOG to so successfully infiltrate and exfiltrate Kaliningrad and St. Petersburg. The Siege of Norrköping The Russian forces at Norrköping have prepared themselves for a siege fortifying themselves as best as possible, preparing ambushes and overlapping lanes of fire. They have little artillery to support them, but have plenty of ATGMs and RPGs, not to mention mortars. Around Norrköping, Swedish forces are closing in, preparing for the assault. North of Norrköping, the so-called volunteers of the Finnish Mannerheim Legion have been deployed by their Swedish commanders to assist in retaking the city. As the Nordic soldiers look on, precision strikes from Gripen fighter jets and Archer artillery hits Russian strongholds all along the front line. Skirmishes are fought in the north, but they are more a diversion. The main assault is in the south, where the Swedes can rely on cover in the woodlands to push in close on the city itself. Fighting is fierce, as the Russians know they have little to no chance of escape. 
veterans from Ukraine. They are battle-hardened and Moscow loyalists. They have no intention of going down without a fight. The Swedes push on and make good headway despite stiff Russian resistance. At the end of the first day of battle, Swedish forces in the south are ready to push into the streets of Norrköping. To the north, Swedish and Finnish units manage to cross the open fields, but not without casualties. Swedish troops do run into one major obstacle. A pair of circular apartment buildings on the edge of the city have become proper fortifications in the hands of the Russians. Despite artillery hitting the buildings time and time again, Swedish troops cannot approach them without coming under heavy fire from RPGs, rifles and machine guns. After three days, Sweden has secured the city south of the river. Except for the two fortifications that are still holding, despite being continuously hit by artillery and bombs and missiles. In the north, Swedish and Finnish forces push on, but not with as much success. After another two days, Russia has been forced back so they are more or less only holding on to the industrialized island outside of Norrköping, surrounded on all sides by Swedish and Finnish forces. Meanwhile, the Russians at the circular apartment buildings are still holding on despite the barrages, despite Swedish attempts to storm the buildings with infantry, tanks and IFVs. On the seventh day, Swedish troops cross the river at two locations and manages to gain a foothold on the island. At the same time, the Finnish troops push across the southern bridge. The Russians are forced to fall back as they become outflanked. They fall back to the main factory area and prepare to fight to the end. After four days of bombardment, Swedish and Finnish troops eventually move in and spends the next 24 hours clearing out the basement levels of Russian survivors who are still refusing to surrender. With news of their comrades' fate at the factory, the last few survivors in the fortified apartment buildings emerge out of the dust and rubble, without weapons, wounded and miserable, waving white flags made from sheets and curtains. The siege of Norrköping is finally over, and the city has been liberated, but at great cost. For every Russian killed, seven Swedish and Finnish soldiers died. The Battle for Erland Russia is holding on to Erland and have fortified themselves as best as possible. Thanks to a few Gripen pilots and two submarines, not all Russian transports heading for Erland made it, meaning the Russian troops on the island never got much needed vehicles and missile systems, not to mention ammunition and other supplies. As Russia grabbed the island, they made sure that missiles took down the bridge to the mainland, as well as the port at Kalmar. Unsurprisingly, several missiles struck the civilian areas instead of legitimate military targets. Russia has prepared to defend two positions mainly on Erland, where they find it the most likely that Sweden might try and land troops. Stora Rör and Färjestaden. What the Russian commanders had failed to realize is that Sweden instead intends to land troops at the north of the island so they can rely on the forested areas for cover. 
the plan is to send troops from Oskarshamn on the mainland to the small sleepy village of Byxelkrook on Öland. Sweden gathers a large force opposite of the southern end of Öland and makes no effort to hide the transport ships or combat boats needed to ship the soldiers across. The invasion of Öland begins with a big airstrike on the southern half of the island against Russian positions. Russian commanders take the bait and are convinced that an assault is imminent in the south and repositions troops from the north once the airstrikes are over. Unbeknownst to the Russians is that for at least a couple of days, Swedish elite soldiers have been operating in the north of Öland, scouting the beaches and reporting back intelligence on the strength of enemy forces and their location. Attack divers and coast jagers have silently made it across the open sea and relied on the cover of night to emerge from the water to vanish onto land. Now the time has come, and relying on the cover of night, multiple Combat Boat 90 race across the sea, followed by three hovercraft, all of them carrying soldiers of Sweden's amphibious corps, all of them armed to the teeth and itching for a fight. As the sun is 15 to 20 minutes from crawling over the distant horizon, Gripen fighter jets flies in and drops precision guided bombs onto targets provided by the attack divers and coast jagers, only minutes before the first wave of combat boat 90 come within range. Each combat boat carries three 50 cal machine guns and one minigun. Some of them have an automatic grenade launcher, and now all that firepower is directed at known Russian positions and appointed landing sites. The amount of firepower aimed at the beaches is awe-inspiring. Newly built mortar ships accompany the amphibious corps into battle relying on the Finnish-made automated mortar system NEMO, pounding enemy positions with 120mm mortar rounds as the combat boats thundered towards the beaches. On land, attack divers and coast jagers raid Russian positions, blow up vehicles and ambush Russian soldiers who are trying to drive to Byxelkrook. The combat boats brave the shallow waters and each one unloads 18 marines into the waist-deep waters. Gripen fighters drop one last set of bombs on the Russians before the amphibious corps reaches land and starts to push in to clear out the village and secure the surrounding area. While the Russians are trying to adjust to the violently changing situation in the north, the Gripens are directing their missiles and bombs on targets further south, allowing the Swedish troops to advance without fear of getting bombed by friendly aircraft. With the beachhead secure, the three hovercraft move in and allows 150 troops to come ashore. The north of Öland is now under Swedish control. As the Swedes push the Russians south, ever supported by Gripen bomb raids, more troops and more equipment can be brought in to the safe beachhead. Combat boats hurry back and forth to bring across as much troops and equipment as possible, as does the hovercraft, but they are now instead focusing on bringing in various light all-terrain vehicles to assist the infantry with rapid advances and for effective Kasivax. Russia manages eventually to hold the line at Löt Torp. Russian APCs and a few IFVs help significantly in forcing the Swedes to come to a stop. Sweden calls in close air support on Russian positions outside of Löt Torp, 
allowing them to outmaneuver the Russian stronghold and outflank the town. Swedish forces can now rely on their in-laws, AT-4s and Carl Gustav launchers to deal with any Russian vehicles, as ranges have now become close enough for these weapons to hit reliably. The Swedes, together with their allies of Hirdviking, push in and begin to clear out Lötorp of Russian forces. Deadly house-to-house -house fighting ensues with both sides calling in mortar support in danger close fire missions to support the attack as well as the defense. The battle for Lötorp becomes a chaotic affair with mortars striking everywhere and soldiers ending up in vicious close combat in living rooms, kitchens, bedrooms and basements. Sweden needs two days to push the Russians out of Lötorp. Two days of cruel fighting at distances of face to face, able to reach out and touch your enemy on many occasions as weapons open fire on full auto. But it is worth it. As Lötorp is liberated by Swedish forces, the Russians abandon all positions in the north and fall back to fortify a defensive line at Boriholm. Boriholm itself becomes a fortress that Russia have no intentions of surrendering. At the same time, Gripen fighter jets keeps striking ground targets, as reported in by coast jägers and attack divers operating on Öland. Russian commanders are struggling to organize their troops. It is at this time that the Swedish forces in the south cross the sea and make landfall around the southern tip of the island. Russian forces fall back to prepare proper defenses away from the assaulting Swedish troops. More and more Swedish soldiers are transported onto Öland, both in the north and in the south. Gripen keep dropping bombs and missiles onto Russian positions. Russian troops are harassed and ambushed by coast jägers. The Boriholm line holds under the pressure, but in the south the Swedes manages to keep pushing north. Eventually, Swedish forces manages to break through the Boriholm line by relying on combat boats to bypass it at sea along the eastern coastline. With Swedish forces behind them and in front, the Russians on the eastern flank have no choice but to fall back. Swedish forces are quick to utilize the opportunity and pushes south and opens up the entire front line. Meanwhile, coast jägers hit the rear echelons of the Russians, taking out mortar positions and ammunition trucks. The Russians prepare for a grand last stand at Borgholm. But there will be no grand last stand for the history books, as by now Russian soldiers begin to surrender, first a handful then a full platoon at a time, then entire companies. It doesn't take long before the Russian commanders at Boriholm have to face reality and they eventually order all their troops to stand down and surrender. Swedish flags are seen all over Öland once more within only a few hours. The island has been freed of Russian occupation. 20 days of war. Norrköping is liberated roughly 24 hours before the Russians on Öland eventually surrenders. By this time, the war has lasted 20 days, almost three weeks. The Russian assault on Stockholm, Norrköping, Öland and Karlskrona were in the end all futile, except that was the whole point. Russia needed thousands of soldiers to threaten the Swedish mainland. Because only then could Russia focus entirely without interruption on conquering, occupying and fortifying Gotland. And now, on the 20th day of the war, Russia is sending in all the troops and equipment they can as fast as possible from Kaliningrad relying on aircraft, 
military vessels as well as civilian cargo ships that have been confiscated by the Russian military to partake in the war effort for this very purpose. The sabotage conducted by the SOG while slowing down Russian operations at Kaliningrad have not been enough to prevent Russian forces from being transported to Gotland. NATO was quick to lock down the Gulf of Finland, denying Russia any chance to send in reinforcements to support the war effort from St. Petersburg. Of course, Russia had planned for this and had for years moved as much equipment, supplies and ammunition to Kaliningrad to allow a steady supply of all things necessary to reach Gotland. Sweden has nine corvettes as of 2024, of which five are the advanced Visby corvettes. When Norrköping and Öland have been liberated, Sweden has only three Visbys left and two Göteborg class corvettes, both of which are in need of repairs. In 2024, Sweden has only four submarines. Three of those are of the famous Gotland class. By 2028, two of the Gotlands are expected to have finished the advanced upgrade to the new high-tech Blekinge class. The Södermanland class submarine was lost at sea to enemy depth charges. The Gotland submarine was sunk as it was rearming close to shore by Russian missiles. One Blekinge submarine was damaged while rearming, surviving the missile strike by sheer luck. Of the 165 combat boats 90s available to the Swedish Navy as of 2024, 53 have been sunk or damaged by enemy fire, mainly during the defense of Stockholm. Sweden has three functional corvettes and one Blekinge class submarine left to fight at sea. As the invasion began, Russian operators had already infiltrated Sweden and targeted Swedish Air Force pilots. Having mapped their daily routines and spied on them for a couple of weeks before the first shot was fired, when the order is given to go into action, the attacks are swift and deadly. 18 Gripen pilots are assassinated along with a third of the Hercules pilots. One of Sweden's Early warning and control aircraft cannot fly at all because all crew are murdered before they can report in for duty. During the main engagements at Stockholm, Gotland and Karlskrona, 32 Gripen fighter jets are shot down by Russian missiles and a further 12 are damaged by shrapnel from proximity detonations. Sweden went into the conflict with 50 Gripen C and 60 Gripen E. Of these, all shot down aircraft are of the older Gripen C, as are eight of the damaged aircraft. The assassinated pilots are replaced by pilots still in training, forced into service ahead of finishing their training. Russia gathered a powerful fleet in order to invade Sweden as they brought down ships from the Northern Fleet to support the invasion. The combined forces of the Northern and Baltic Fleet would allow Russia to have 75 surface warships to send towards Sweden, supported by 20 submarines. For our scenario, Russia sends 43 warships at Sweden and 12 submarines. A more than capable mix of powerful frigates, missile carrying corvettes, minesweepers, and landing craft, including one of Russia's two mighty battle cruisers, the heaviest type of surface warship on the planet that is not an aircraft carrier. After 20 days of war, Russia has lost 14 warships to Swedish anti-ship missiles and torpedoes, 
together with another 18 civilian cargo ships involved in the invasion. A further 12 vessels have been damaged and are in need of repairs. Among the severely damaged ships, we find two notable entries, the mighty battlecruiser Admiral Nakimov and the aircraft carrier Admiral Kuznetsov, both having received multiple torpedo hits from the two Swedish Blekinge-class submarines. Sweden managed to defend the mainland despite being outnumbered and outgunned both at sea and in the air. But as thousands of Russian soldiers set foot on the Swedish mainland, Sweden could not afford having any air or maritime assets helping out with the defense of Gotland. Securing Stockholm, securing the mainland, had the highest priority. You might ask, what about Sweden's missile defenses? And the answer is, unfortunately, there isn't enough of them at least by 2024, at least according to what can be found online. Sweden has six mobile launch systems for the powerful and state-of-the-art anti-ship missile RBS-15, known as RBS-15KA. Each of these platforms can carry and launch four missiles. As a result of all things combined, Russian missiles could focus on targeting Swedish forces on Gotland, which allowed Russian paratroopers and landing craft to establish beachheads and then transports and civilian cargo ships, carrying even more troops and equipment, could throw in all the soldiers and hardware needed to overrun the island and eventually fortify it. Gotland is now protected by a powerful fleet of Russian warships. Cargo ships are steadily bringing in more equipment, and Sweden has very little chance of doing anything about it. At all. The free war rages. Fria kriget rasar. Gotland is under Russian occupation. It will be months, maybe years, before the Swedish armed forces can realistically attempt to liberate the island. Martial law is implemented across the entire island and Russian rules are harsh and brutally enforced. But if there's one place in Sweden where the population knows what is expected of them, it is here. They have known for years, for decades, that Gotland would be the front line if a war started. And the people of Gotland know better than most Swedes the meaning of the segment on the page 12 of the government-issued booklet if crisis or war comes. If Sweden is attacked by another country, we will never surrender. Any information that resistance shall end is false. Hidden away at various places across Gotland, the remains of the Swedish forces have gathered in small bands. Career soldiers, home guardsmen, drafted personnel, conscripts, army, navy and air force. They have all avoided capture after the island eventually fell to the horde of Russian soldiers. Now they are resting, licking their wounds and trying to come up with a plan on what to do next. On how to contact other survivors. On how to keep fighting. As days go by, as the small groups of soldiers establish contact, their ranks swell as civilians volunteer to join them in the fight. Gotland has some 1,200 registered hunters on the island, and now closer to 400 of them join the resistance. There are plenty of rifles and ammunition on the island. And the soldiers, they know where there are secret bunkers filled with military weapons ammunition, and explosives. As the various groups begin to coordinate their efforts, they set out to gather intelligence on the invaders. They locate command hubs, fuel and ammunition depots, 
schedules for patrols and guards, they count the number of aircraft and ships that are assigned to the defense of the island, etc. But they do more than that. They plan ambushes. The resistance avoids armored transports, but instead target trucks, jeeps and other light-skinned vehicles, doing quick hit-and-run attacks, violent ambushes and raids. The tactic is called the Mad Minute, where you overwhelm an enemy force with massive firepower to kill everyone, then rush in to grab important papers, maps, radios and so on, before leaving as fast as possible. When the attacks happen at multiple places all across the island, the Russians realize that the battle for Gotland has only just begun. In 1940, Sweden learned the importance of irregular warfare after the lessons from the Winter War. Elite units were formed called lumberjacks with orders to go deep into enemy territory and cause as much chaos as possible if Sweden was invaded, to freely wage war as they saw fit. This idea was later modified to suit all units of the armed forces, no matter the branch, original task or function. If any Swedish soldier, airman or sailor found himself cut off from friendly forces, he had a standing order to try and link up with other cut-off forces and continue the fight relying on guerrilla tactics to fight a free war against the enemy. The concept was then expanded to include even civilians. Civilians on occupied territory in case of an invasion were to resist the invaders by any and all means available, to freely wage an insurgency until the occupied territories had been liberated. The free war, Fria Kriget, can only end with a Swedish victory. No politician can end it. No military general can order it to stop. A government cannot give up territory to a foreign invader to put a stop to it, and no mutual ceasefire can put an end to the resistance. If Sweden is attacked, by another country, we will never surrender. Any information that resistance shall end is false. The resistance hits Russian targets all across the island, day and night. They are aided by locals, despite all the risks involved. Ammunition and fuel depots are attacked at range with Carl Gustav launchers. Officers are assassinated by hunters who have now become snipers. Russian troop transports and trucks drive into deadly ambushes where machine guns cuts everyone down in overlapping fields of fire. And with each successful raid and ambush, the Swedes grab Russian weapons and ammunition. The fight must not end. A month into the occupation, the resistance is contacted by members of the SOG who have managed to make it undetected onto the island. Arrangements are made to ensure that the resistance can report back safely on a regular basis to the mainland about Russian positions and troop movement, where they have logistics set up and where they store supplies and vehicles. Without guarantees, the armed forces will attempt to ensure that weapons and rations are shipped to the resistance via submarines. Swedish resistance has Russia enforce even stricter and harsher rule over the occupied Swedes. People are arrested and interrogated at random. People vanish and are never seen or heard from again. Some appear on video in the news, admitting to being terrorists and murderers, clearly showing signs of having suffered torture. Women and teenagers are being violated in every town and village. Men and boys are put into forced labor and are either severely beaten or even killed if they refuse. Helicopters patrol the island constantly in an attempt to locate the resistance fighters. But the Swedes who are willing to fight have help. Ordinary Swedes provide them with food and shelter, 
give them information on Russian movement and how to avoid being detected. At night, graffiti pops up on walls all across the island. Till Valhall, to Valhalla, a call to fight on as hard as possible, despite the odds, despite the opposition, to fight no matter what, to fight and die for your family, your friends, your country. There is one huge threat to the resistance fighters. Collaborators. Twistlings, as they are known, with utter scorn all across the Nordic world. Every now and then, a fellow Swede sells out the resistance, resulting in loss of life, loss of equipment, or at best, only loss of sleep. The motive of the Quislings are varied. Some break under pressure, others do it for personal gains, and some do it to simply save their loved ones from torture. Life on Gotland is harsh, cruel, and fuels hatred on both sides. Sweden cannot challenge the Russian fleet at Gotland with the few ships the Swedish Navy has left. Sweden's only hope lies with the Air Force and the superb Gripen Ease and their deadly cargo of advanced Meteor air-to-air -air missiles and RBS-15 anti-ship missiles. But Sweden only has 60 of them, a dangerously low number to rely upon when flying into a storm of Russian anti-air defenses. But being able to challenge the Russian warships and the defenses on the island is one thing. An even bigger problem is how to get troops transported safely across the Baltic Sea to Gotland to launch an invasion in order to liberate the island. Swedish commanders are confident that they can rely on their remaining Gripen to strike at the Russians, together with all five corvettes once they have been repaired. And they know that the last Blek in a submarine can deal a deadly blow to the Russian fleet. Sweden asks their friends in the EU and in NATO to supply them with landing craft so that the island of Gotland can be liberated from tyranny and oppression. So how can Sweden avoid all of this? Like I repeated from the start, begin preparing now. Have at home what you need to survive a few days without having to visit the store, without relying on running water, without relying on the power grid. And consider if you can contribute to the Home Guard. The government is doing its part, and I am confident that it doesn't matter who is Prime Minister, the government will keep doing its part. Conscription is being increased and war placements are handed out. And we should trust the armed forces when they tell us to be prepared, because they want us to prepare now so that we are ready ahead of time should something happen two, five, eight years from now. NATO membership does seem like a guarantee for 2024 at the moment. Maybe it will drag on to 2025. Maybe it will drag on for longer. But until Sweden is in NATO, there is one more thing Sweden can do besides getting its own citizens ready and prepared for the worst. The US Defense Cooperation Agreement signed in 2023. While the DCA does not include any obligations for the US to rush to Sweden's aid in case of a conflict, it does allow the US to station troops and military equipment in Sweden, if Sweden invites the US to do so, and if the sitting US president agrees to do it, along with the US Congress. It would allow Sweden to have US forces stationed on Gotland in order to deter Russia from ever launching an invasion against Swedish soil. Because there is only one place Russia would try and occupy that belongs to Sweden. Gotland. If the US agrees to Swedish invitations and US troops are deployed to Gotland, Russia would never dare to try anything as foolish as using military might against Sweden. After that, it is only a matter of waiting for Hungary to do the right thing and allow Sweden into NATO. Providing 
that the sitting president is willing to assist Sweden at all. That's it. The third and last part of this short brief series. If you uh, stuck with me from the beginning, I hope you enjoyed it. You may have heard my cat jumping in the background. And, uh, but this is it. Uh, Sweden. If you're a Swede, remember the famous order from the Prime Minister back in 1981 to the armed forces as 12 Soviet warships were heading for Swedish territorial waters to grab the Whiskey on the Rock submarine. Håll gränsen!